Welcome to the Doggy Dojo. I'm your host, Susan Light, a Los Angeles-based dog trainer on a quest to become worthy of the title Sensei of the Doggy Dojo. Today's episode is about navigating all the contradictory dog training advice on social media. Social media isn't the only source of misinformation, but it is a huge source. You can certainly use the tips my guest talks about today to think critically about many sources of information about dog advice, from blogs to the guy at the dog park, but we're going to mainly focus on social media. My guest completed the intensive internship program at When Hounds Fly and then earned her CPDTKA certification. Although her love for dogs began in childhood, her passion for science and psychology was born in university. After graduating with her degree in psychology, she began to dive into animal psychology and learning theory. Keeping up with the latest dog science is what drives her to improve to become as effective and humane as possible. After spending some time on dog training social media, it became apparent to her how critical it was to begin tackling some of the misinformation on Instagram and TikTok. She loves creating educational content on social media to help pet parents navigate the dog training world. Please welcome Shalina Seifert. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so pumped. I'm super excited. We met, I mean, for as much as we've actually met, um, on Instagram. Yep. So I think I think you've been a really positive influence on the Instagram space, and I think I think you're a great person to talk about this. It's there's so much information that we get constantly from media, but also specifically social media, because it's not vetted, right? Although I don't know how well vetted media is these days. Yeah, they, Instagram has been selective in some of the topics that they choose to vet and look at, and dog training is certainly not one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So what we end up with is all these videos with so much just bad information or so much conflicting information. How do you even start to sort through it all? Yeah, and I think that that is something, what you just said, needs to be acknowledged by a lot of people. I don't think people are aware that there is a ton of misinformation out there. I think there's people who believe that these are just different perspectives and just different ways of doing things and that there's really no science or right and wrong in dog training. And that is simply not true. Um, we do have a lot of great dog science available to us. We, we have some great evidence on what methods work the best and protect the welfare of the animal. And there are some methods that don't. And we also have a lot of misinformation being spread that are, you know, it's just not in the best interest of the animal's welfare and may look really good, but has really serious consequences. So I think it's important that we first acknowledge that drug training is a science. There, there are right and wrong ways of going about it. Mm-hmm. I think social media is where people get a lot of their information these days, as we know. I think TikTok, for example, is mm. an absolutely gigantic platform, and yeah. it will have a huge impact on how people see their dogs, see um, you know, how, how the, the, what the relationship with their dogs will be like and what kind of trainer they will look for ultimately when they decide to get a dog just based on the content that they consume on these platforms like Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, because they're very visual. YouTube as well. Um, yes. But I think because YouTube is long form, it gives a lot more room for actual like tutorials and discussing things a little more in depth, a little bit more like a podcast, for instance, right? where you can actually sort of delve into something. But I mean, that's what we have to remember. TikTok and Instagram, these are tiny, tiny little bites of of visual information. Yeah, absolutely. It's really important to vet this information before you act on it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do we do that? (laughs) It's a pretty overwhelming task. It's one of the most unfortunate things about the dog training world on social media is typically the accounts with the most followers are actually the ones spreading the most misinformation. And that is challenging because 
a large number of followers may suggest credibility, yeah. right? Through, you know, basically social proof. Social proof is, you know, if somebody's unsure about what they should do, they're going to look to others to see what others are doing. You know, how many people bought this? You know, how many reviews does this product have? How many followers does this person have? And if a bunch of people are doing it, following it, liking it, commenting on it, it can seem very credible. That and is such a good point. Yeah, I think I think the reason that a lot of these trainers have so many more followers than me, for example, is they have really good marketing, really good marketing. Yeah. You know, there's really uh, flashly, flashy results. For example, you'll see a lot of trainers posting about their obedience, you know, dog sports, uh, lots of dog sports, but I, I see very common on TikTok specifically posting, you know, their formal obedience heel. And the animals in these videos are seemingly under complete control, which mm. I think people desperately desire. As a dog trainer, when people come to me, they're looking for control over their animal's behavior. How do I stop this? How do I get them to do this? Right? Yeah. And when we see these videos of this dog walking in this perfect heel or, you know, bite sports where the dog is mm. just able to call off of, you know, a super intense bite just by one little word, people are just so attracted to that. It, yeah. And it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you can teach a dog to heal, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, overcome fear and anxiety and reactivity with an animal. But that, but I think those videos really appeal to people yeah. and yeah, just really good marketing. It just looks great. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that for me, a large, large following, like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of followers or God forbid, millions of followers mm -hmm. on Instagram is like almost a huge red flag for me. Oh, like absolutely. I, I, I immediately start digging deeper and I'm like, mm, you know, uh, and that's what's so sad about it. It's it is like, so sad. Uh, it's, it's so hard to be in an industry where all of the evidence points very clearly in one direction. Yep. And all of the popular opinion points so very clearly in the other direction. It's, it's really frustrating day by day. And I know you understand that. Yeah, it is frustrating. I, I actually, I was doing some research on misinformation on social media and I found that there is a relationship between credibility and the number of followers a person has on social media, and it's actually the inverse relationship. So in other words, the more followers somebody has, the less credible they probably are, which is mm. so funny. And I don't think it's a cause and effect relationship. I think it's just, you know, it just happens to be that way that the people with mil hundreds of millions of followers actually tend to be the least credible people on the internet, which is so funny. It's not funny, but you know what I mean? You have to I laugh. I do, yeah, because I'm telling you, like, I, we're, we're both in the same boat of like trying to build yeah. our smallish following and not necessarily, I think for us out of even a hope of getting clients, right? Like, right. Um, because we don't live near enough to serve right. any of most of the people that we would reach on Instagram. But it's we're really passionate about spreading positive reinforcement around and try to combat some of this misinformation. But the truth is, it is time consuming to create content. Yeah. It's energy draining to create content. Yeah. And um, when I'm actually training, it's like I can train or I can make a video. I don't know training. how people film themselves and film dogs. I I mean, I, I bought yeah. a little tripod and I never remember to set it up. <laughs> like Good for you, that's a that's a step beyond what I've taken. <laughs> it's like, and then you like, how many hours of video would you have if you just filmed anyway? Anyway, yeah. problem. Yeah. But it's, yeah. so that's the thing is, I totally get, I totally can vibe with that because you can either be out there doing the work or you can be making videos, right, on Instagram and TikTok. It's yeah, I, I do think there are trainers who are truly dedicated to their marketing. And I, I talk, I talk to, you know, rewards based trainers, positive reinforcement based trainers, and I try and talk them into dedicating a portion of their life to creating content. Because <laughs> I just think it's so important. But you are spending a lot of time and you're going up against very large accounts with very large followings who completely disagree with you. Yeah. Absolutely. And anyway, so that is just sort of where we are. Yep. And so that's why we're here because I think a lot of the people who listen to this podcast 
are also sort of uh, casual consumers of Instagram and TikTok right. possibly. And so you come across these things and I've had followers send me videos and be like, what do you think of this? And I've had to like sort of go through the red flags with them. Um, right. And, you know, if they're, ha- if they're opening this conversation, they're very receptive to it. But let's, let's assume if you're listening, you're receptive to the idea that you want to be able to vet this information. You see a video about a dog, about dog training, about something, about animal welfare, and you want to be able to know if it passes the sniff, the sniff test. Yeah. You know, let's, let's walk everybody through uh, some practical ways to do that. Because like you said, there's a science, there's a yes, there's a no. There mm-hmm. are actually ways to know. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's typical strategies for identifying digital misinformation that I think we can utilize. Verifying information through trusted sources, I think, is you know a, a way of dispelling misinformation, not just in the dog world, but all around. Yeah, and absolutely. I think when you have some trainers talking about how to do something that is in a direct violation of what the science suggests we should directly contradicting it that should be suspect to us and i know the average person does not know anything about dog science but that's what i was just about to say (laughs) they do not but if somebody is citing those sources and i try and do that as much as possible anytime Mm -hmm. i say something anytime i promote something I do try for those that are interested to show where I got this information from. And a lot of it points back to the scientific research. And so I hope that that adds credibility to my account so that when I say something that somebody doesn't believe, I have something to back it up. And a lot of what I say, unfortunately, does contradict what a lot of people grew up with, right? We grew up Mm -hmm. with a lot of us grew up with a way of dog training that I would not recommend today yeah. with TV personalities that are on big talk shows. You know, these, mm-hmm. these gigantic dog trainers with TV shows are on talk shows and it adds so much credibility. And now here I am a small dog trainer with a really small following saying, no, don't do that. Um, and so I have to have those sources to back yeah. up what I'm saying. And so if somebody is pointing to that science, I think that's that's somebody that you can trust. And there are amazing trainers out there with uh, research backgrounds themselves going out there and actually participating in research in the dog training world. We, you know, I, and those people, obviously, you know, you had Dr. Susan Friedman on your uh, podcast, which was amazing. People like that who have yeah. an education, they've got experience, and it's validated by the scientific method. And then you've got people who are speaking in direct contradiction of that. I think that's the first step. Um, it was the first step for me. And that's how I found positive reinforcement-based dog training. I know not everyone cares about science. And I know that everyone has the privilege of being educated enough to read it. But I do think a lot of people are – that's how I found a lot of people find my account is hmm. I talk about science. I talk about the dog science that's available. And and when people hear it, it – it really forces them to question what they thought they knew, how they grew up with their dogs, how they grew up, how their family and how their their father or their mother trained their dogs and their grandparents trained their dogs. It really forces them to question what they thought they knew because they go, wow, this is is obviously a really credible person, right? Yeah. Okay. So follow the research back. And I think people, obviously I'm going to put your Instagram account and some other links uh, in yeah. the show notes so people can find you. Do you still have that highlight with yes. all of, yeah, so like clickable links to scientific studies that are backing up these claims that positive reinforcement dog training is better for the animal's welfare. You don't right. have to take our word for it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think looking at people's experience, I think who you learned under is something that is really valued in the dog training field. And is this person self-taught or did they attend, you know, a, a value, a valuable training school, a training organization? I don't think that all good trainers are educated and certified, but the majority of positive reinforcement based trainers that I know that I really respect and are doing a great job are. And on the other hand, people that are not tend to be promoting training methods that are not in the interest of our dogs and, and the welfare of our animals. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, there are great trainers doing great things that 
learned under other people and are not necessarily doing aversive and, and compulsion based training. But just like you said, people who study because all the science points this way. So if they've studied somewhere or they've got a certification, they're more likely to have come across this information and be doing it the right way in a more positive way. Yeah. And I hope in the future that we can make things like certifications more accessible to people. It is an expensive thing to do and dog trainers are not super well paid. So I think it's important that those organizations are, you know, giving things out like, you know, um, scholarships for people of color, et cetera, to make it more accessible to people. So yeah, yeah. I think that's the first thing. Absolutely. Uh, the next thing I think that we can look at is something that all people who are in the care of animals should value and prioritize. And that's the five freedoms of animal welfare. Yeah. I think that this is, this is very basic. And if we're violating basic needs of our animals. I think that that's a really big problem. So the first one is freedom from hunger or thirst. Something Mm -hmm. that I think we really take for granted in the dog training world. There are people who advocate for, you know, using hunger as a motivator. Yeah. There are really people, you know, there are people on the very far end of the spectrum who starve dogs Mm. for a few days in some cases to increase motivation which is obviously very extreme, Mm -hmm. but if we are not respecting an animal's basic needs for food and water, I think that's a really big problem. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And the second one, freedom from discomfort, you know, Mm. (laughs) we could get into this one, but again, I, no matter what is going on with my animal, I am trying to make sure that she is physically protected. You know, something as simple as a dog who is lunging and barking, I'm going to make sure that that dog is on a harness, a dog, a a harness that really protects my dog's body as much as possible while I'm training to ensure that there, there is freedom from discomfort Mm -hmm. or injury. Right. And that's the next one. Freedom from pain, Mm -hmm. injury or disease, freedom from pain. I think again, people listening, I don't think anybody is saying, I really want to cause my dog pain. I'm really okay with that. I I don't think that there's very many people out there like that. I think, again, when it comes back to the marketing, I think people can market training methods so that it sounds like it's not painful. Yeah. So we're going to get into body language to see how our our dogs are very stoic. So it's hard to know, but there are some subtle signs that they do give us to indicate whether or not they are in pain. Yeah. And then freedom to express normal behavior. So I I, th- I love this one because I spend so much of my day trying to provide really safe outlets for my dog to do this. And it breaks my heart when people try and limit this. You know, things like sniffing, yeah. rolling, digging, biting, barking, barking, chewing, destroying, all of these amazing doggy things. If a trainer is suppressing natural behavior specific to that species I think it's going to come out in destructive ways yeah I don't think it's in the best interest of our animal and their welfare and it just doesn't help your relationship at all it makes training really difficult actually Shalina is at Indie Does Tricks on Instagram and TikTok. I've put links to both in the show notes. Consider supporting her advocacy for humane treatment and dog training by following her, sharing her content, and interacting with it and commenting. We'll be right back. Yeah, absolutely. And Dr. Susan Friedman said, too, she said, you know, if you are, because punishment suppresses, behavior. So, you know, we'll talk about this, but, um, you know, if you end that behavior with punishment, you suppress it, but you don't meet that need. If we create a a gap in the activity budget, we don't know how they're going to fill it. Right. Right. So they have these needs. They're called needs for a reason. They're going to try a different way to meet those needs. And it's probably going to be a little bit more desperate, a little bit more frantic. Yeah. And I think if your trainer is talking to you a lot about how to stop behavior without replacing it, that is a very temporary solution. And like you said, can come out in other ways. So how do we replace problem behaviors and how do we provide safe outlets for this behavior? Those conversations need to be had. Yeah. 
And the last one, freedom from fear Mm. and distress, which, you know, unfortunately, a lot of training methods utilize fear. Yeah. And when you punish enough, your animal can essentially learn how to avoid it and live in a constant state of fear of consequences that we inflict on them. Which is so anxiety inducing. It totally is. I think there's also myths that our dogs don't feel those things. They don't feel anxiety. They don't feel fear. They don't, that, that those are not emotions that our dogs feel, but we have a lot of evidence to suggest that they do. I will put a link about the five freedoms of animal welfare, because I think it's a fantastic framework um, to, it's a great lens to look at all these things through because basically all of these things that uh, we're trying to get people to be like, please don't do this to your animals. It's violating one of those five freedoms. Yeah. So that's yeah, easier absolutely. to see if you think about it that way. Yep. Yeah. And you know, the, the hierarchy of needs was adapted for dog needs as well. There's a hierarchy of dog needs as well. And it, it, it's very similar to the five freedoms at the bottom. There's biological needs. There's mm. emotional needs next social needs and training needs, a do no harm approach, and then cognitive needs where we have choice, novelty, problem solving. So emotional needs, I think, is consistently overrun. And we are, there's a lot of misinformation that our dogs don't feel certain things and they certainly do. Oh yeah. I totally yeah, agree with they that. They certainly do. So let's talk about how, because I think I honestly think most people, especially the ones that are, because I know, because I I have clients even right now that have worked with other trainers like this and, and we're sort of picking up the pieces right now and then they come back to be like, oh my God, I can't believe I put my dog through this. They told me to mm-hmm. do that and I did it. And now that now I see, you know, what I, what it was. Yeah. Um, so I don't think anybody who loves their dog really intends to harm them through their training they're just following bad advice and so the problem is we don't I don't think we can trust the evidence of our eyes sometimes unless we've really learned how to see um, some certain things that we learned because when we talk about these people on social media they have these huge followings because they post all these videos I look at these videos I'm horrified I'm horrified but why are five million followers not horrified Why are they going to run out and try it with their family or, you know, and their dog or find somebody? So let's talk about what do we see in these videos that they don't see? Right. I, you know, I think there's two pieces to this. Like you said, everybody loves their dog. I have not met a single person who doesn't love their dog as much as I love my dog. I don't think I love my dog more than anybody else loves their dog. I just don't believe that. And so when people have hurt their animal or, you know, gone against some of these five freedoms, I know that it's a really hard realization for them because they've realized what they've done. And because they love their dog so much, it's even more painful to admit that they were wrong and that they made a mistake. And that's why I take it so personally to remove the burden of blame from just the average dog guardian. And when people come to me and say, actually, I, I, I did this to my dog, I say, that's okay. I know you love your dog and I know you would never want to hurt them. And I know that it's not your fault. And so I think there's two things that are really appealing about some of these videos and to an untrained eye, it can look really good. First one is really fast results. Yeah. There, there's a big selling point for people, right? Just because we love our dogs does not mean they don't frustrate us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I have a really great dog. She's really good. She's very well behaved, but she frustrates me almost once a day. And, you know, when we look at problem behavior and we're frustrated, it can be really tempting to go, I can fix that in seven days. I can fix that in a week oh my gosh, of course I'm going to hire this person. Why would I not hire this person if I can get it faster versus somebody else is telling me it's going to take months, right? Yeah, yep. So, you know, there's a lot of before and after videos like we talked about. It's it's very challenging for us to actually capture a lot of this stuff, but some people really dedicate the time to having before and after videos for things like reactivity, aggression. And when people see a dog who is lunging and barking, 
on the end of a leash to seven days later walking calmly next to their human. That is so Can we so put calmly in air quotes? Yes, calmly. that's what I'm going to get to. Yep. And, you know, we as trained professionals are identifying it as learned helplessness, but to the untrained eye, it looks like this dog is just walking along. And it, to the untrained eye, it looks like that dog was more stressed out when they were barking and lunging than when they're actually walking next to their human. But when we know how to identify stressed body language, we can see those subtle signs. Dogs are very stoic. It's very hard to know when they're in pain, when they're stressed, unless you are trained to identify some of those things. How do we identify stressed body language in dogs? There's some really amazing, back to social media, there's some great information on social media on how to identify stressed body language if you're following the right people. (laughs) Yep. We'll put some of those accounts in the show notes. Yes, that would be great. Uh, Some really subtle signs of stress that I see very commonly in a lot of these videos is lip licking. Mm -hmm. So the dog is not eating, but they are stress lip licking their their mouth. Yep. Another one that I see a lot on these videos is yawning. Mm. So unless the dog is sleeping or really tired, there's really no reason for them to be stress yawning constantly through a training session. Yep. Uh, you know, sometimes ears back, ear, the ears pinned back, although that, that can indicate other things as well. All of these All of these body language cues have to be taken in context, and we can't just look at one thing and identify how a dog is feeling. We have to look That's at right. the entire animal. Yeah. So, yeah, some obvious ones are, you know, cowering, shaking, uh, you know, a, a tail between the legs. Those are very obvious ones, but these subtle ones of lip licking, yawning, ears pinned, panting. Avoidant. Yes, like avoidance. Add, that's a huge one. Looking away, you know. That that they is know, a huge they know one. you're there. Of that avoidance is telling you something. Absolutely. I think on the other side, when we see dogs who are happy to participate mm-hmm. in training, they are going to look like they're engaged with the person, right? They're looking yeah directly at them, you know, their tail might be wagging. There's loose body language versus really subdued body language or stiff body language. Yeah. You're seeing a really loose, happy tail, uh, loose body language, um, things like that, I think, identify a, a dog who's really excited to participate in the training as they absolutely should be. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I would say like the whale eye is one that when you start looking for it, you can see, you, yeah. depending on the dog, but generally you shouldn't see the whites of a dog's eyes. Right. And it starts to be very obvious if you start to look at their eyes. If you can see any white, um, that means one, there's tension in their face, which mm-hmm. is a sign of stress. And two, um, that they're probably like over alert, hyper vigilant going Mm -hmm. on, which means that they're concerned about their environment. So um, just start to look. uh, If you can see any of the white in the dog's eyes, that's usually a really good indication that they are stressed. Right. Absolutely. And I think we talked about learned helplessness. And what does that look like? For me, you can tell when a dog has shut down. And this can happen not just from punishment, but from removing opportunities for reinforcement over and over and over if the dog continues to be set up to fail over and over and over again where they just continually get it wrong you can have a learner just completely shut down just start to look for these things in these videos and um, once you learn it you can't unsee it and it will change the way that you feel about these videos absolutely it will no longer become appealing and i when i hear things like well does your way take longer i always say no it does not to have yeah. real behavior change, it does not take longer to do it a, in a positive reinforcement-based way. Real, true behavior change takes time. What are some other red flags? So the body language, we hope you're going to learn and you're going to be able to see it. But what are some other red flags we can see maybe in verbiage? And um, I have a couple that I think are red flags for me. I'm excited to hear what you think. Uh, we talked about one thing that I was going to say, which was guaranteeing mm-hmm. fast results. Any guaranteeing of change in a living, breathing creature, I just, it's not possible. So that's a big one for me. Yeah. Another one is anything related to dominance theory 
alpha theory, any kind of pack, pack yep. language for yep. me is a big red flag. So this idea that we need to be a pack leader for our dog, we need to be in control of them. They need to know who's boss, who's in charge. They need to feel that we have complete control over them. All of those things are going to hurt your relationship with your dog. And yep. trainers who tend to buy into dominance theory also seem to have outdated methods because that theory has been debunked almost 50 years ago. Yeah. So that's a big one for me is watching for that. Yeah. Um, I also think some of them, um, oh, balance. Let's make sure we say that word. Balance. Yes. Is Another just... great marketing strategy. Balanced sounds incredible. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the best oxymoron of all, balanced, positive reinforcement. Yes. Or some, some are relationship-based, like relationship-based trainer I hear a lot of, which, um, again, <laughs> a bit yeah. contradictory to the yeah. methods, but and the thing about the balance when they say, Oh, I, I use treats and I use this because there's four quadrants, right. Is like mm -hmm. even Skinner who identified the, you know, the quadrants for, for us never said that it was ethical to use them and never said that the punishment was an effective way to change behaviors, you know? Yep an individual's Absolutely. behavior. So um, it's like, hello. I know. And using all four quadrants, I think, again, is another strategy, uh, a marketing strategy, because it makes you sound more skilled than somebody who only uses two, for example. Yep. It makes you sound like you can help more more dogs because you know how to use more you tools. More you know tools. how to use more, yep. more quadrants. You can, you can tailor your approach more effectively to the animal. When in fact, we know that punishment is not needed to learn. Yeah. Thank you, Shalina, for joining me today. To recap, learn about canine body language and try to see if you can spot how the dogs in these videos you're seeing online actually feel. Ask yourself, is this training advice violating any of the five freedoms of animal welfare? And dig deeper if you see some of these red flags. Dominance theory, alpha, pack leader, balanced, quick, or guaranteed results. Think twice about hiring someone with no certifications or educational credentials. And do your research on any credentials or certifications someone claims to have. I've linked resources to help you with all of this in the show notes. Thank you for stopping by the dojo to learn with me this week. This is your aspiring sensei, Susan Light, signing off. You can find me at doggydojopodcast.com or I'm at Susan Light LA on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook. The music was written by Mac Light. You can find him at maclightsongwriter.com. If you like the show, you can support it by subscribing, sharing it with your friends, rating it, and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts. I'll be back in two weeks with another new episode of The Doggy Dojo.